Greetings in the precious and mighty name of Jesus Christ, Savior and Lord of all. Welcome to this broadcast from the New Testament Church of God, Harvest Temple in Wolverhampton. Thank you for taking time out to join us. I know that you'll be blessed and encouraged as you continue to view. For those of us who have been following the New Testament Church of God National Convention, I hope that you are enjoying it so far and you have been challenged and greatly encouraged. And let me remind you that it continues later today at 4 p.m. with a children's session and then there will be a session with celebration and praise at 7 p.m. In a moment, we're going to move to a place where we will be singing together and worshipping and blessing our God. But before we do that, I want to invite you to just join me in prayer. So let us pray. God, our Father, we thank you for you are glorious. You are magnificent. Lord, you are the most supreme one, the ruler of heaven and earth. And we are so privileged, Lord, to come into your presence with boldness through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, your son. And Lord, I, I give you praise and I give you thanks for you have preserved us, you have kept us. Lord, you give us meaning and purpose for life. And we meet on this form today to celebrate your greatness and to thank you for all that you are doing and continue to do in our lives. We praise you. We say hallelujah to you, God, who is our great king. You are the master of every situation, Lord. Our life, our times are in your hands, and we don't have to fear anything because we know that you are the God who's in total control of all that's happening in our world. So, Lord, we present this broadcast to you and all the contributions that are to follow. We ask in Jesus' name your blessing upon the contributors and all those who are viewing and worshipping along wherever they are, in their homes or elsewhere. Your blessing nonetheless will be just as real and tangible as it is here in your house. And for this mighty God, we give you thanks and we commit everything into your care. Lord, all our worries, all our anxieties, our pains, Lord, our illnesses, all our challenges we bring before you. And may we, as we sing, as we hear the scripture read, as we receive the word of God from your servants, Lord, that our needs will be met as we reach out to you in faith, trusting you, God, because we know that you make all things beautiful in your perfect time. And for this, we give you thanks in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Can we just lift our hands a moment and just give God some praise? We've sang the song and now we have to do the actions. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We thank you for your presence, God. We thank you that you have given us the ability to dwell in your presence, God. Hallelujah. And we will lift our hands. We will lift our voices. We will lift our lives to you, God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We just want to give you praise. We just want to give you worship. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Good morning, church. This morning's reading will be taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 11, verses 39 to 44. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odour, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Let us honour the reading of God's word by saying, Amen. Good morning, church. It is my honour to be here to deliver the, the word this morning. I'm going to be speaking from John 11, and if you are taking notes, as is always good to do, I recommend that you uh, put this title down, and the title is Died But Not Dead. Died But Not Dead. Now, I know that's a, a bit of a weird title. I know that's a bit of a um, probably grammatical error, but just stick with me and you'll understand. So, Died but not dead. I want to start by just acknowledging that a great word by Bishop last week, um, where he focused on the conversion of the Apostle Paul. And if you didn't get a chance to listen to it yet, you know, I, I do encourage you to go back and, and listen. And he focused upon the miraculous circumstances that took place in order to uh, co convict and convince and, and to minister to, uh, to Saul and, and his, his conversion experience. And I already started to prep this message, but it got me thinking about miracles, and I did a bit of research, as is, as is important, and the Gospels record approximately 37 different types of miracles. And those miracles can be broken down into about seven categories, so I'll, I'll go through the categories, um, we'll, we'll look at the miracles, and then we'll go into the main body of the message. So the seven categories are fed thousands, fed multitudes, cast out spirits, Healed water to a wine conversion, controlled the elements, controlled nature, and raised from the dead. So let's break those down into a little bit more detail. So uh, the first one, we see two accounts, one in Bethsaida and one in Galilee, where the Lord fed thousands of people. And this shows that he is a God of provision, he is God that provides for us and meets us at our most crucial needs. He also um, takes what we have and improves it for the betterment of other people. It shows that Jesus had a, a genuine and innate care for people. And it also showed that he wasn't afraid to operate in front of thousands of people, to minister to thousands of, of people. And that everything he did was in private or in secret. The second type, as I mentioned, is cast out evil spirits. And we see that he was able to cast it out of people and cast spirits into animals. And that shows that he had, again, the authority over these spirits. He was um, a, a, a person that the spirits feared. There was a, a humility, a, a fear, a concern about them. It also showed, again, that he cared about people and wanted to deliver them from their experience. And it also showed that Jesus was about restoration, about restoring us back to the place where we were created. The miracles he's most commonly known for are the, the healings, the healing of the sick, the deaf, the paralyzed, the mute, and many more. We, he, we see here that he had the power over affliction. That he was not bound to illness, he was not bound to sickness, and again, sickness itself had to bow under the authority 
of, of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. He had the ability to make us whole. He was able to give new and improved life. How do I say new life from healing? Well, actually, um, he gave the ability for people to rejoin society. Those who had leprosy, the woman who had the issue of blood, they were ostracised from society. They weren't able to mix with friends and family and, and, and live what we would call a normal life. But through the healing work, the healing miracle, the healing power of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, people were able to regain relationships, were able to get jobs, were able to become what we would class as normal citizens. So for some of them, it was an improved life. For some of them, it was a life they've never experienced. It also showed that he has omnipresent power. Why do I say that? Well, we had the story of the centurion servant. And the centurion servant was ill and Jesus said, oh, come, let me go. And the centurion says, no, I'm a man of authority. I understand that you can say it right now and it will happen. You don't have to come. Just say it from where you are right now. And it showed that Jesus' power can, is, is not bound by geography. It also shows that with the centurion who said, I'm not worthy for this. That Jesus will do miracles for those that are deemed as worthy and those that society and maybe other people may deem as unworthy. He was no respecter of class or person or division or, or caste. None of that. He was all about meeting our need. The water to wine, it's a, it's a unique one, it's a separate one. It's interesting because it's his first miracle. How does he enter the stage of his miracles? Well, this is it. But it's more than just people getting drunk. It's more than just the festivities and the celebration of the wedding. It was about covering shame. It would have been shameful for the family to run out of wine. It was a height of embarrassment for a culture that is very hospitable. So he covered the shame. And again, all these things are just examples of his ministry throughout. It's examples of who Christ is. And we see it throughout many ways. But each miracle attests to a certain part of his divinity or his character. So we see him cover the shame just like he covers our shame with salvation. Our shame from sharing all the crazy stuff that we've got involved with previously. And once again, it shows that he's a God who provides for us. He cares about the, what we would, on a, on a macro level, we would look at and say it's a, a small thing. He cares about those small things. He cares about how we are viewed. He cares about our relationships. He controlled the elements. Again, multiple stories. Walking on water. Calming the storm when he was sleeping. It shows about his protection. It shows about he's able to create peace in the midst of turmoil. It shows that even though things don't necessarily bother him, because let's, let's remember Jesus was lying in the boat asleep, the calm in the storm wasn't for his benefit, it was for others. But it also shows that he has no limit, he's not bound by physics or nature, he is limitless. Which leads you on to the sixth one, which is he controlled nature. He made a fish bring him money, again speaks to provision. He withered a tree, he gathered fish. Again, this speaks to his authority he has, the dominion he has over this world and the inhabitants thereof. And finally, we see at least three times that Jesus rose the dead. Of course, we know that the, the most famous one, the biggest one, that Jesus himself overcame death by himself, rose from the dead after being in the grave for three days. But before that, on his death, Jesus died, and the Bible says that the old saints rose up and walked amongst the town. Just speaks once again to his liberation, to his, his power, his uh, resurrection power, that in his death, even before his resurrection came, in his death, he was already, already resurrecting people. But before that, we have probably the second most famous person for being raised from the dead, and that is Brother Lazarus. Now, we have to bear in mind that Lazarus was a friend and his family were friends of Jesus. And we see them pop up a few times in scripture. We see Mary most famously anoint Jesus' uh, feet with the, the broken alabaster box. 
And for those of you who don't know the story, that, that he, 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 that Mary broke the box, and, and this was expensive ointment, very expensive ointment, like a perfume. And the disciples in uproar, well, she could have sold that, and she could have gave it to the poor, and all these kind of things, but Jesus was like, no, 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 what she's doing is right. She's honoring at the right time. So Jesus knew the family. He was emotionally invested in the family. And yes, he's invested in us all, but there was a, he walked with them. There was a, there was a, a strong bond between them on a, on a human nature. Now, we find that Jesus is told that Lazarus is ill. Now, he was told he was ill, but we know that Jesus is omniscient. We know that he is all-knowing. We know that he would have known that Lazarus was ill. But he hears that Lazarus is ill, and in John 11, verse 4, he says, and he sends a message back and says, the illness does not lead to death, it's for the glory of God, and so the Son can be glorified. Jesus then knew later on, two days later or so, that Lazarus had died. But Jesus said it doesn't lead to death, and then we'll come on to how it doesn't lead to death, because Lazarus had died, but he was not dead. So Jesus knew that Lazarus has died. It doesn't say in the text, as far as I could see, that anybody came up to him and said, just to make you aware. Nobody bent over and whispered in his ear like you see people when they're at a podium or when they're in a meeting. You see the person leaning and whispering in their ear. There was none of that. We see Jesus knew that Lazarus had died and decided to head over to Judea. Now the disciples were like, hold on, hold on, hold on. Don't go to Judea. Don't forget the Jews are, are wanting to stone you. You're, you're, you're at risk. And Jesus said, I'm going. I'm going anyway. And why is that important? It shows, once again, his, his benevolence. It shows, once again, his care and love for us, that he is willing to risk his safety, risk his own life to bring us new life, which is exactly what he did later on at the cross. And it's interesting that we have Thomas pop up, and Thomas doubted and we always focus on the negative. We always focus on, oh, well, he didn't believe. Thomas doubted. Thomas is like, I don't believe this is right. But Thomas also said, I'm going to go and die with him. He may not have believed it, but he was prepared to be with Jesus every step of the way. Yes, Thomas wasn't perfect, but neither am I <laughs> and neither are you. He was willing to go step by step. And even unto death with Jesus. We have to ask ourselves, who are we surrounded by? Who is in our corner? Who is supporting us? So he arrived in Bethany. And Lazarus had been there in a tomb for four days. Now it's important to understand that the body would have started to decay in those four days. Especially within the heat. Now I'm not sure where he was. He would have been in a tomb. So the tomb would have been colder than outside. But he would have started to decay nevertheless. The internal bacteria within the intestines would have, have eaten through the intestines and started to digest the surrounding organs. Insects would have started to lay eggs, and those eggs would have started to turn into maggots and larvae, and they would have began feasting on the body. And the gases would have built up in the body as, as the body decomposes, and the smell would have been awful. Especially if it hadn't been, he hadn't been bound or covered in ointment, just like the one that Mary put on Jesus. Now here's a, I'm not saying this is scriptural, this is just a thought to, to, to consider, but maybe part of the reason Jesus was saying, don't worry, when Mary anointed him, when Mary poured the oil, because maybe he was saying, it's okay, because she's not going to need it. Maybe that oil was put to one side for a family member, for a family member when they died, and maybe Jesus was saying, it's all right. It's not going to be needed because actually I'm going to come through. The provision that you had is unneeded. So we see that he arrives and Martha meets him away from the house. And she runs up to him first and she speaks the whole truth. Verse 21, she basically says, he wouldn't have died if you would have been here. But even now, if you ask God for something, it will be done. She's grieving, she's hurt, she's lost her brother. She's saying, look, if you would have been here when we asked you to be here, he would still be alive, but 
I recognize that even now you can do something if you see it fitting. And Jesus tells her, listen, your brother will rise. Now she's thinking about the, the, the ultimate resurrection. She's thinking about the, 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 the heavenly resurrection. It's like, I know, I know he'll rise. I know he'll rise from the dead. And Jesus is like, no, I'm not talking about that one. He said to her, and we, one of the most famous uh, passages, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she says, I believe. There is a belief, there is an understanding of who Jesus is. And in, who, in him, there is life. And that life is not only living, but it's resurrection life. It is bring back from the death life. Jesus is saying here, listen, your brother has died, but he is not dead. It is a comma and not a full stop. Mary comes then. She's been beckoned by others and Mary comes out. And she's still in her feelings. And we have to understand that, yes, she's speaking to Jesus the, the Messiah, but she's also speaking to Jesus, the friend, and she's upset and she's hurt, and she says the same thing that Martha said at the start. If you would have been here, he would still be alive. And we see that Jesus later on goes on to, to weep. Now, I don't believe he wept because he was upset that Lazarus had died. I don't believe that because he knew Lazarus had died. So why wasn't he crying beforehand? And now, Maybe it's because he's around people and, you know, sometimes when you get around people after someone's passed away, only when you get in the presence of others does their face and, their, you know, stir up emotions and make you upset. Maybe that's the case, but I believe he wasn't upset because of that. I believe he wept because he felt the emotion of those that he loved. He felt the pain of those that he loved because he understands our pain. He loves us. He cares for us. He understands our pain more than just a... A, uh, a theory he deeply understands because we have to bear in mind that nothing was made without him everything that was made was made because of Jesus so when he created our nerves when he created our emotions everything was was intentionally created by Jesus so he understands our emotions at a far deeper level than we do than any neurologist any any counselor any psychologist he understands it at a so deep rooted level and I believe personally that's why he wept. So then Jesus went through the process of resurrecting him. First of all, he said, take me to him. So he moved over to where Lazarus was. Notice that Jesus moves to us. The Bible says the Holy Spirit is the one that convicts us to become saved. Jesus, Jesus isn't out there far away and we have to search all over to try and find him and Jesus is waiting for us. Jesus has already moved outside your door and he's just waiting for the door to be opened. So he went, made himself available. He's already traveled, remember, but he went to the tomb. He said, take me. He then made the stone be moved. Why? Because there was an external blockage. There's no point in him raising Lazarus from the dead and then leaving Lazarus in the tomb and he can't come out. He removed the external blockage. Also, what's the point of Lazarus being raised and then dying again in, in starvation or whatever, or asphyxiation? But also, nobody else would have seen the glory that Jesus was about to do. We have to bear in mind that sometimes the miracles are for us and sometimes they're a witness for other people. This is why when we have our testimony, we shouldn't be shy or cute about what, the, what God has done for us. Let us shout it from the rooftops. He then commanded Lazarus to come forth. There was a commandment, right, now it's on you, Lazarus. I'm telling you to get up and come. Now, I don't know how Jesus said it. He might have said it in, in that kind of powerful, dramatic way, Lazarus, come forth. He might have said, Lazarus, come. Just come on. I don't know how it was said, but regardless of how it was said, he commanded Lazarus to come. And Lazarus came forth alive. But what happened? Lazarus was still bound. He was alive. He was moving. He was, um, he was uh, unblocked as, as the stone had been moved away. But he was still bound. Now, he was rightfully bound because he'd been, he had died. They bound him to protect him. Sometimes, guys, we are bound. And things that were there that had a purpose 
or have, have been the right thing for other situations are not right for us. Or they're there for us a brief amount of time. And Jesus said, loose him. See, he had all he needed. He had his life back, but he was still being restricted. And we have to think, are we like Lazarus in any way? Are you like Lazarus even today? Are you ill? Is there something that's not quite right? I'm not talking, yes, physically, but I'm talking more emotionally. I'm talking more spiritually. Is there something going on where you just need a little bit of support? You need Jesus to come and just help you out. It's nothing major, but just to kind of get you going again. Get you operating in full function. I damaged my knee a couple of years back and I still can't fully function on it. But you wouldn't tell when you see me walking. You wouldn't, you wouldn't tell when you see me taking a little jog. You won't tell normally. But I know that I'm not in full function. Is there a little need? Are you dying? Are you declining? Is your faith wondering? Have you lost the zeal or the passion? Have you lost understanding? Are you in turmoil at the moment? Is your, your head just, you just can't focus? Are you fatigued and tired and losing the will? It's okay. Because Lazarus was dying. But he wasn't dead. And eventually he died. Lazarus died and his life was no more. They'd arranged the ceremony. They'd, you know, they, they were picking out. They'd put him in a tomb. They'd put him in a tomb already. But Jesus was chill about it. Because remember Jesus said that, that, that death wasn't his end of the story. Death wasn't the journey. The end of the story was going to be the glorification of God. And it was because he, he had died. But he was not dead. It was just, I said it before, it was just a comma. It was just a pause. That full stop was not there. It was not the end of the chapter. It was not the end of the book. It was a brief moment for a gasp of air while it continued. So he had died, but he's not dead. Maybe you, you're there and you're like, I give up. I'm done. And church, I've been there as a Christian. I've been there years, years ago. And you know what? Not so long ago where I'm like, actually, I'm tired. Lord, I'm tired. I'm struggling with this. I remember being young, I remember being 19 or so and having that conversation with God and saying, God, you know what, I'm done. I just can't do this no more. And I felt God come into me and be like, fix up. I felt God come in and say, listen, <laughs> you feel like you've died, but you are not dead. There is more in store for you. Get up. And that set me on a different course in terms of my faith. Or are we in the position where we're coming forth? We've been in that died situation. We've, we're coming back now. We're, we're energetic, but some, we're still kind of bound by something. Maybe we're bound by bad theology. You know, I, I love theology. I love learning about the Bible. I love learning the, the subtle nuances of things. But when I started learning the Bible, and I started listening to preachers. I listened to some really dodgy and some bad preaching. And it's taken me years to unlearn some of the things that I've learned. And you know what, guys? It's okay to know bad theology and address it and learn from it and move on. What's not okay is to learn bad, bad theology and cling on to it so that you don't have to admit that you've been wrong in the past. Let's develop, let's grow, let's move on. You may be understanding milk at one point, but it's now time to move on to the meat. That's how we become unleashed. Maybe it's confidence. Maybe we're ready to move, but we've got that little niggle. We've got that anxiety. I don't like speaking to people, just like Moses. Or maybe I'm not that literate. Jesus picked up fishermen to change the world. Whatever excuse you've got, the Bible's going to say, yeah, I see that point, but here is the counter argument. And even if you find a situation where you can't find an answer, you can't find a match for your circumstance, I'll give you the counter argument of, that's a good one, but God... If you're telling me that your circumstance is bigger than the God you serve, 
then maybe you don't serve the right God. Because my God can overcome everything. Everything we struggle with is, is, a, is a, little, a little problem. It's a light work for our God. So whatever situation you may find yourself in, and even if you're, you're fine, maybe you're in a situation you're like Martha, and you're saying, you know what, I'm seeing other people who are, who are bound, and, and Jesus, please just fix it right now. Or maybe like Mary, you're like, why haven't you done it, God? You could have, solved, you could have stopped this problem. You might be able to identify with any of these characters. Maybe like Thomas, or, or, or you've got people around you like Thomas. Maybe like, I see this problem with somebody, but you know what? I don't agree with what they're going through, but I'm going to go with them anyway. We all have our role to play in this story. The importance is this. We have to play our role within that story. So if you need support, if you're ill, if you're dying, if you're dead, if you're coming forth but you're still bound, get in contact with us. You'll see our information at the end of the program, at the end of the podcast. You'll be able to find us on the website. You'll see us on Facebook, wherever it is, but get in contact with us and I'm sure one of the ministry team will be happy to support you and talk through with you. Because we are a church that recognised that Lazarus had died but was not dead. Jesus died but is not dead. And you may have died, but you don't have to remain dead. Because Jesus came to bring resurrection and life. God bless you. I hope the word has ministered to you. Let's turn the words we've heard into action for the glory of God. Amen. You have listened to our podcast and now want to start or renew a relationship with Jesus Christ. Congratulations. That is the best decision you could ever make. But how do I become a Christian? I will take you through the three simple steps and a prayer to help you journey with Jesus. You must 1. Ask God for forgiveness. You must 2. Believe your sins are forgiven because God has heard and answered your prayer. 3. Finally, you must confess that Jesus Christ is your Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I know that I am a sinner and that I cannot save myself. I believe that Jesus died for my sins. Please forgive me of my sins. I choose now to turn from everything that I know is wrong. I receive your forgiveness and trust in Jesus alone for my personal salvation. Lord, I give you control of my life. From this day forward, help me to live every day for you in a way that pleases you. Thank you, my Lord, for saving me and for forgiving me. Amen. If you had said this prayer and believe it, welcome into the family of God. You are now a born-again disciple of Jesus. We and the angels celebrate with you that you have decided to follow Jesus. We want to encourage you to tell somebody as soon as possible. Don't wait more than 24 hours. Part of coming to faith in God is sharing your experience with others. Please use the contact details on the screen to get in touch with us. We will speak with you and give you further details on how our church can support your Christian journey. We look forward to meeting you soon. May God keep you by his grace. God bless. Please remember to register for church on the church website if you wish to attend church next week. And please continue to check the website for weekly updates.